my name is Nick Schultz. Um, today's date is July 6, 2021. Uh, we're at the Fairhope Public Library. It is myself and Angus Mori. Okay. Purpose of the interview is for the um, oral history program that the Fairhope Public Library is uh, documenting. Uh, good to meet you. Where are you from originally? Pensacola, Florida. Are you? You live here in Fairhope now? I do. Do you? What do you do for a living? Uh, odd jobs, construction, drywall finishing. So you look like a construction mm -hmm. i uh but i also collect uh disability from the va yeah. and uh, stay at home dad pretty much i do the odd jobs when they present themselves you know because it's yeah it's my trade sure. and extra money how many hurt, kids so. you have i have three biological and one stepdaughter okay so uh and two little ones that live at home with us now oh, two really? girls uh, one's about to be in middle school the other is about to be in the fifth grade okay i raised them since they were babies, right? As soon as I got out of the army, I came home, and the first, the littlest—I mean, the oldest one—not the oldest one, but the one in middle school. She was a baby, just born. I assumed daddy detail, and been doing it pretty much ever since. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Uh, when were you in the army? I joined February of 2002. Okay. Uh, about six months after 9/11. And I was medically discharged, honorably medically discharged in 2011 for a stress okay. anxiety disorder. You were in for a long time then? Yes. 2002, 11, yeah. It, right at the that. start of the Iraq war and it was still going on when I left. Yeah, it was still going until I guess yesterday you wanted or something like Afghanistan, that. Afghanistan, yeah. yeah. Which we'll probably have to go back. You were, <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think you're right. You were in Iraq, you didn't? No, I never went to Afghanistan. Three, three combat tours in Iraq. Okay, what uh, what branch were you in? What? Army, combat okay. engineer. Okay, yeah. All right. 12 Bravo when I joined identifier, and then uh, about a year or two after I was in, it changed identifiers and went to 21 Bravo. Okay. So they could put it on support That's rosters cool. rather than combat elements. Okay. Which I don't know why, but that that is because it was 12 Bravo forever. Yeah. And then it changed when I was in. Combat engineers, you dealt a lot with, I guess, explosives or that sort of thing? Yeah. The original job, classic traditional job, the combat engineers, uh, pretty much... Uh, Blow things up? Yeah. He, the combat engineer, as opposed to the construction engineer, yeah. which is, deals with construction, and that combat engineer either, it says what it says Con he engineers the battlefield to suit our needs whether mm -hmm. it's defense or offense, offense. Yeah. yeah so uh we travel with the main elements of uh, combat you know tanks and infantry and when they get stopped by something mm -hmm. we go ahead you know whether it's a minefield an obstacle a blockade whatever we destroy it to try to keep the movement going okay then of course when we get to where we're at we are in charge of defenses so if we set up camp or whatever, we provide the defenses for whatever base or anything that's we're setting up at the time. Did you have a choice what branch you went into? Was it engineers or? I had a small choice. Mm -hmm. uh, when I joined, I did have a small criminal history, which prevented me from certain jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing major the criminal history, but uh, it did, you know, the Army looked at it that way. You know, I wanted to get into aviation, but because of it and certain clearance pass, uh, passes you yeah, uh, I think you have to at least security, security clearances yeah. and stuff you can't you got to have a pristine record and things like that so the recruiter gave me some choices that he saw that you know and there was it was pretty small it was like infantry food services or combat engineer <laughs> how old were you when you were near uh 22. okay you had been out of school for a while yeah you? yeah okay yeah uh well, i could see combat engineer i can see why you wind up in construction yeah well the recruiter of course is like you blow stuff up you know yeah. it's fun you get to play with explosives and all this stuff and uh i mean he didn't lie but he didn't tell the whole truth right. <laughs> <laughs> you I mean, know i got the basic training and there's all these pictures of mines all over the walls i'm like what's up with all these mines and he's like you know what guy that I was in there he's like that's what we do we disarm mines that's like nobody told me that <laughs> <laughs> and here we that's, are that's the od i thought dude. no no well in the 
traditional mm -hmm. classical job of the combat engineer, yeah, we would deal we deal with minefields and clear mm -hmm. minefields, whether it be manually or with large, like the Miklik rocket you may mm -hmm. have seen or heard of. The, shoots about 300 meters and it drags a trail of explosives I've behind it. seen videos. And then it lands and it blasts a trail, which is a lot nicer than having to go out there and do it manually. Yeah, with the well, we never, I never had to do that in, in any yeah. of my experience in combat. I mean, it was, we were, we, we traveled in the initial invasion in Iraq. We were in, in Kuwait during a normal six month training cycle when war, when Bush decided to invade Iraq. So our unit was there poised in Kuwait. We were the first ones in. Our engineers, we were the ones that clipped the wire and welcomed everyone into Iraq. It was a really neat historical moment, we thought. Yeah. You know? But then we, you know, that's the, that's the closest I came to being an engineer in the Army, was the first deployment. First in, in going into Iraq? Yes. The rest was just like acting as police, and combat patrols and presence patrols. And, how long were your tours over there? The six months at a time, or well, the first one? Um, the first one was about nine months. It, the, I came back a little early before my unit because of a medical issue. Mm -hmm. I had to have a cyst removed, mm -hmm. and they they removed it in Iraq. And but when the doctor got in there, he saw that it was infected, so I had to leave the wound open. And he's like, "You're gonna go home?" And I was like, yeah. "Wow," because we were unknown at that point we'd done been in iraq we took over baghdad we took over the palaces we we were living in one of the palaces okay. the, the olympic palace was our domain we were in charge of um, guarding because the olympic palace had like 15 large car garages huge like two-story roll up he lived well didn't he well yeah and, and that was for something to do with their lawn equipment or something there the olympic really? i don't know what else they would have kept in there but it was a huge, huge garage, and as weapons and caches were found throughout Baghdad, they all the units would bring them to us, and we would store them in this place and, ca and catalog them and keep up with them and uh, prepare to hand it over to the next government that we were trying to next to set up, you know. Yeah. Nation building. So that was like our first, okay. what we did the first trip after we made our way into Baghdad. Backing up a little bit, where'd you go to boot camp? Uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, mm -hmm. home of the engineers. And then from there to? My first duty station was Fort Stewart, Georgia. Okay. And uh, don't, I don't really remember the unit because soon after I got there, we switched units and became a part of 464 Armor. I couldn't ever remember. Yeah, that. every unit and everything. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Fort Stewart and then from there to overseas? Yeah, Fort Stewart, I was there uh, about June, I got there June. 2002 okay. was there for a few months and then my unit went on their regular six-month deployment to Kuwait which we had been doing since the Gulf War okay the 90 early 90s yeah. we'd kept a presence in Kuwait and we rotated out troops there for training desert training which we lasted for you they're supposed to be six-month deployments for training purposes in Kuwait desert training and uh, so we three months after I'm at my first duty station we go to Kuwait and we're out in the desert doing regular training for a few months until, of course, March of 2003 when we invaded. Yeah. And like I said, we were poised. We were already there with our equipment. We were, our entire division, 3rd ID from Fort Stewart mm -hmm. was there. And uh, yeah, and then we went into Iraq on March. Yeah. And uh, the rest is history. Yeah, <laughs> but probably. then we got up there and, uh, you know, like I said, uh, a few months into it, the summer came along, and uh, then I came back home because of the cyst removal. Mm -hmm. And then, what? Where'd you go from there? Uh, you get that well, when I got back home from there, I was in. I was actually going to come close to the end of my Listen. agreement, but stop loss actions have been implemented that kept soldiers from getting out. Mm -hmm. Unlike the draft that brings you in unwillingly, mm -hmm. this doesn't let you out unwillingly. So yeah. Stop loss had occurred, and I realized I wasn't going to get out. So it was better for me just to honestly re-enlist yeah, and, get, and get duty station of choice, leave. Did you get a bonus at all? I got a small bonus. Yeah. It wasn't nothing to really speak of. It yeah. was honestly, it aggravated the heck out of me because a buddy of mine enlisted like a re-enlisted a month later and got an astronomical amount of money. Really? <laughs> yes, just because... You know, it was just, you know how it is. And sure. It's just like point system and 
promotions and things like that. Mm -hmm. One moment, one month it'll be this way, and then the next it'll be oh, nothing. Oh, it's just the luck of the draw. Yeah. Too. yeah. So anyhow, I re-enlisted, mm -hmm. and they gave me duty station of choice, which I chose uh, Fort Carson, Colorado, Fourth Infantry Division. That's uh, is that Colorado Springs. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, most the most beautiful army base there is. That's I swear. What I've heard. I've never Other heard maybe that. than so the Schofield Barracks in Hawaii, but yeah. Yeah, Fort Stewart. Were you stationed at Schofield at all? No, no, no. But I heard the stories. Yeah. Because people that were stationed in Hawaii come to Fort Stewart, yeah. I mean, Fort uh, Carson, they're like, this is pretty good. <laughs> it's not tropical, but it's beautiful. You know, huh? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it ain't tropical. It's cold long, and dry. How long were you there? I was there for the rest of my, so uh, 2000, and I, w I left Fort Stewart around 2004 or late 2000. Yeah, early 2004. Uh, when and I chose that division purposely too because I had a choice of other duty stations, mm -hmm. but they were going to be at home long as they just left, or actually they were just about to come back from their deployment because okay. they came in after us just a little after Third Infantry Division. They they started coming in with 101st Airborne and all them, and so they were about to come home. Whereas Fort Stewart was about to turn around and go right again. There was already rumors of like, we're going to leave soon. We're going to do six months at home and refit and re blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. And I was like, no. As soon as you get the bed bugs out of the gear. Yeah, yeah so I re-enlisted for Carson, which would have put me home for a couple of years. So. Were you married at that time? Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. I was married with my my son, my only son, and he was a baby at the time. And Yeah. yeah. That makes a big difference in your thinking, too. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. And uh, So, yeah, then I went to Fort Carson. And I was there the rest of my time throughout. Now on my sheets, I put 2011. That was my last moment in the Army. I spent about a year on medical furlough or medical leave, you know, during the determination process of my uh, disability to see if I was going to be medically retired, which I was Good. at 30%. And they retired me at 30%. And uh, I took it. And, and that, was, that, was, that, that was it. But I did two deployments out of... Fort uh, Carson, Colorado. Where, where to? Back back to Iraq. Oh, really? Yeah, no. they're always around. Uh, they're always around Baghdad. All three deployments. Of course, the first deployment was the invasion, so we traveled from Kuwait to Baghdad. But the next two deployments were also around the vicinity of Baghdad. Okay. And uh, how long were those deployments? Those were both a year. Actually, uh, the second one was eighteen months. So you spent good part of your enlistment overseas yeah yeah I spent more time gone than e you did here even when I was at home the training was unbelievable too especially once war kicked off the army went into hyperdrive when mm -hmm. it came to training and retraining and refitting units and then of course in the beginning everybody thought it was all going to be quick and over and painless and it yeah mission accomplished so mm -hmm. to say but it, it wasn't the, like that what, yeah, <laughs> I know it. it never is <laughs> and it turned into what it did and yeah and the army was literally it seemed like they were uh, learning as they went along again and it's like when you're there you're thinking man we've been at war we've been in many 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 wars and i know everyone was a little different than the other but you think we after 20 years have this down it. by now you know because it seemed like we're always adapting yeah. to did you, you, had, you were by this time a sergeant uh, when I, I I made it to the rank of specialist at Fort Stewart, when I came back from Iraq, I was a PFC. I, I was promoted to PFC in Iraq okay. on my first deployment. Came home to Stewart and promoted E4 specialist. Soon after that, I went to Carson as a specialist. Wasn't long I was there and I got my sergeant, my E5. I you know, went to PLDC and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, Went to the board. I went to the board in Georgia actually before I went to Carson. I went to the board and passed. Good. So it was just yeah. waiting for the points system to properly. For the paperwork to catch up. And that's yeah, that's and funny. about a month later or so, I was sergeant after I got to Carson. It wasn't long. Uh huh. Which was kind of good because in the world of rank and subordinates and all that, I was amongst strangers now, and now I'm a sergeant. So I wasn't, you know, a a friend becoming a sergeant now his friends are having to take orders from you know right. <laughs> so, I, yeah I, I understand. it, did, it, it was a, good it makes a difference it did sure it made did. a god difference they had a lot more respect i guess because they didn't know me and, and yeah and, you know, so but yeah and then i uh, made sergeant there and uh right before my third deployment i made e6 oh, okay so you got out as a e6 that's what i retired as an e6 staff, yeah, staff sergeant. sergeant yeah 
Squad leader. Squad leader. Good deal. Okay. So, do they base the uh, disability on your rank? They don't, do they? Uh, I think it's a percentage of a certain amount of money. Well, when it comes to the Army re yeah. retiring you, I'm sure they do factor that in. I mean, mm -hmm. and how much time you've had in, and of course, you know, if you're an officer or not. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm sure they do. They factor all that in. Okay. But, uh, and of course, your severity of your injury, and I, I'm sure they've got some kind of formula that they use. Do they reevaluate that? You said you had 30%. I mean, would yeah. they, uh, they go back in and say, well, you really ought to have 40 or 50? Well, uh, when they uh, declared that amount, I was still in, in, at Fort Carson, and they finally came to the decision and said, okay, they're willing to retire, put you out at 30. And I'm like, okay. Uh, I took it. Mm -hmm. I could have stayed around and fought it a little longer and got it increased and went for the PTSD. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Uh, but uh, the, the doctors were explaining to me that it would take a lot longer to get out. Harder to prove. Harder to prove. A whole lot of and the, Plus, the thing was, I was back home before my unit because, again, I, was, I started suffering from the, the symptoms mm -hmm. while in Iraq. And uh, it was so bad, they sent me home, you know. And then... Uh, but my unit was still, the entire division na near was in Iraq. Mm -hmm. And uh, at home, it wasn't so bad. Because you can understand when 25,000, 50,000 troops get back and they clog the system m <laughs> medically and everything sure. else, it becomes a very slow, awful process. So I quickly got out before they got back just to avoid all that. Yeah. <laughs> because I knew it would be bad when they got back with all of, the medical stuff that was going to occur so no uh the year i sat around for a year after they, they i left the army i had my terminal leave mm -hmm. plus deaths they evaluate you one more time within a year after you leave and i had one more evaluation and i had to go to fort benning because i was home now yeah. here so they sent me to fort benning for my last evaluation this was by the army yes yeah. Okay. And at this time, I'm still making my full E6 pay all the way up to that last. So a whole year, I was at home here mm -hmm. in the Army still as an E6, making E6 pay, but just waiting to be put out. And, yeah. and then that's when they declared 30% after my Fort Benning. That was the final thing. I mean, I knew it was coming. I mean, it was, we sure. had talked to doctors about it. but So that was that. But since then, I have, I have a file claim with the VA and... And now I collect my money from the VA and not the Army, yeah, and it right. has increased through the VA my percentage, good, good. which is good. So. Uh, when did you when do you officially get out? Your I officially got out February two thousand eleven. My eleven, okay. yes, two thousand eleven. Yeah. Yes, so I, at the end of two thousand nine, very end of it is when I left and came home. Like I said, I was here a whole year or more before they. Mm -hmm. But I was still in the Army, technically. They could have said, hey, come back. You know? <laughs> we need you. Yeah. yeah. How come you went in the Army? Any particular reason or just closest recruiter? Or uh, it? Well, it's a story to that. The whole reason I came in the Army to begin with, and it, I mean, I don't want to sound, I don't know, selfish or... This is, this is a... Well, I mean, it wasn't, for, it wasn't, I wasn't like a patriot saying, I got to go and get some revenge on this 9-11 thing, even though yeah. I joined five months after it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was really because uh, I just had my, my first son was born and I, doing construction, wasn't cutting it, paying the bills. And I'm like, well, I guess it's that cliche time to go and join the Army because I got to pay for my family somehow, you know. Sure. And so uh, I, I said, well, the military. At first, I wanted to join the Navy. I was in Pensacola, the Navy yeah, town. You grew up in Pensacola. Yes, and I, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, I'm like, I, I knew lots of Navy affiliated friends and their fathers and stuff in Navy. Yeah. And, yeah. But the Navy like, no, you got too much of a record. We're not, we don't want you. Really? That, that, yeah. Yeah. Even during that time, I think that was a point, though, right there when everybody thought we had Afghanistan wrapped up because we bombed them relentlessly thinking, mm -hmm. you know, we never knew, thought that we would go to yeah, Iraq. They stopped that war just a few months too so early. The, yeah. The military yeah. wasn't taking all the derelicts yet, <laughs> so, you know. So. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, but uh, that, that basically that's the way it was because they wanted everybody to have squeaky clean records at that moment in time to enter the military. You know? So mm -hmm. I just gave up on the, them. I called the Marines and they're like, don't even worry about coming down. Nah. And I'm like, dang, you know. And I talked to the, this Army recruiter, like last shot, and uh, they had me come in and do the ASVAB 
test, a mm -hmm. test of the test, mm -hmm. just to see where I stood. And I did really well, and I told him all that, and we kept on trying, and he eventually got discouraged because of my criminal, cause I, criminal history, I guess, because the recruiter has to accompany you to all these places if there are mul multiple places that you ever had any kind of criminal uh, record, and you have to go and get a waiver from that judge of that county. Oh, really? Yes, really? and the judge has to sign off on an official waiver that, yes, let this individual join yeah. the military. He's of sound mind, and I think it'll be good for him kind of thing. Yeah. And see, the recruiters don't want to have to do that. It's, that's a lot of paperwork, and mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. they'll just pass on that. So I told my uncle, which he was in the military back in the 60s, in the Army, his paratrooper and all that. I told him about all my dismay of trying to join. He's like, well, just try a different recruiter. And I didn't really think of that at the time. I wouldn't have thought of that, but that's yeah, he's like, just try a different pretty good advice. One. And eventually I did. I found a new guy that just got in. And he was trying to make his name as a recruiter, you know, meeting that quota, I guess. And he really went over and under and everything to help me get in. And, and that's how I got in that's through him, through that recruiter that really tried. Makes it, it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, at the, t at the moment, I didn't even know that. I thought it was like either you can get in or you can't. I didn't realize it was, you know, a little bit of leeway on their side. If they tr tried a little harder, it could happen. Because yeah. it was like as soon as your foot's in the door, you're in. And now it's up to you to finish basic training and yeah, continue on. Yeah. But, yeah. So yeah, that's how I eventually did it. I found the right recruiter. Now see, in the criminal history, I had shoplifting when I was 12 years old. I got caught stealing at the mall. And that was one of my, you know. The other one was possession of alcohol by a minor. I was like 18 oh, in Pensacola Beach and got yeah, caught drinking. Kind of give me a break. You these, know, yes, you know, these wasn't, but the military looked at them like, eh, you know, and it just simple little things, no, no big deal, but, uh, but that's the way they saw it. But after I got in and after Iraq happened, oh boy, you know, that's when they started sending us. I was a new sergeant at times mm -hmm. getting these soldiers that were just juvenile delinquents, you know, because <laughs> the army was taking all they could get. Well, that you time. were what, 22 years old? I mean, you know. Yeah, I was like 23 when I was a sergeant. That's, you know. I also, had a, got I also had a tattoo on my neck. Oh yeah? You see, that was a tattoo. Really? I had to get that removed before I got in. And it's an awful nasty scar now, but it was just look bad. It looked it, the scar has gotten better over the years, mm -hmm. but I had a tattoo here, and that was a no go at the time. He says you got to get that tattoo removed, and we're gonna you'll go. And, you know, so I talked to this lady that worked out of Mobile, and she tattooed in water, water lily oil extract underneath the ink to push the ink out, and it took like three sessions. So it's like getting tattooed done three times mm -hmm. in the same place, and it pushes. It was cheaper than laser. It was it was like a hundred dollars a session. It got terribly infected, like on the third one. I about I about died. Mm. But I made it through, and it healed up, and it did used to look huge. So I would never if you hadn't pointed it out, I wouldn't I wouldn't have noticed. But in the world and yeah. story of my life, about I don't know three months after I joined, they changed the rule because everybody getting you know my generation's full of tattoos, and they're finding it hard to get people. people. In, yeah, yeah. You know, so now they made it. It's okay. You can have tattoos, and I was like, man. But yeah, that was that. So that's how I got in. It was a real struggle, it was, you know, trying to just uh -huh. find the right recruiter, get the tattoo removed, all at the same time, trying to get to this certain date because you know they had like sl slots throughout the year that you go and go to MIPS and the entrance. Yeah. So that's how I got in finally. And as I said, it wasn't like I was doing my patriotic duty, which of course I mean I'm that's red-blooded American before I went in, but sure. I became even you grew more up in a military town too. Yeah, you know. I, I did though. But the army, it didn't. The army didn't. I, I feel but, good. I'm, I'm glad I did what I did in the army. I'm glad I joined. Sure. I, it was the best thing I really could have ever done. Even though I came out with this disorder, I do good now. I'm mm -hmm. home. I'm not in combat. I'm not yeah. dealing with the army every day. And, you know, <laughs> that's, and, that's a lot. So yeah. you know, it's like a miracle cure. I'm yeah. <laughs> got away from the army, but yeah. So, I respect the army and I love the army. I wish I could have retired from the army, but I mean, really retired, did mm -hmm. 20 years, become a sergeant major, and one of them guys I always looked up to, you know. But yeah. hey, it worked out. Do yeah. you want to talk at all about the combat experience? Sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Uh, what? Uh, uh, well, my first what? taste of real combat yeah. was during my first deployment, the, the, the initial invasion. Uh, as I said, uh, this is Kuwait. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. leaving Kuwait, making our way up through Iraq, mm -hmm. we had uh, we had been traveling from Kuwait through the large expanse of southern Iraq, which is desert. The, nothing but that's nothing the, but desert until you get to like Karbala, and then you got what they call the Karbala Gap, 
which is an area between the city of Karbala and the border of Iraq, bo Iraq's western border. They call okay. it the Karbala Gap because there yeah. are some hills and such things that impede movement. But it was the best place to go for our whole flow of what, the way we were moving north, with the entire army. And uh, at that time, about three or four days into the invasion, that's when that sandstorm occurred. I don't know if, you know, if people recall uh -huh. watching on TV, there was that three day sandstorm yeah. and that stopped everything. It stopped all of our movement because it was something else. You couldn't see far at all, yeah. you know, it was very- Shut down air power and everything Everything. Yeah. So we lived out of our vehicles literally for like three days piled up. And uh, at that time, the enemy started piling up because we wasn't moving for three days. So and then when the sandstorm cleared, we couldn't move. So they ordered a small contingency of us to go east, like a couple battalions worth of infantry, engineer, mm -hmm. and uh, tankers to go east to draw the Iraq forces away a little bit to ease the Karbala gap. And it worked. And when we got over there, about 20 miles east is when we, we collided with them. And, but like I said, these are huge convoys. Mm. And we're literally in and single, kind of, yeah, you're kind of single file lines, this, yeah. you know, but so miles up ahead, you can hear gunfire and explosions all of a sudden and the radio starts going crazy, you know, and you start listening because we got, we got our internal radios and we got our platoon radios, we got our company radios. The company can listen to the higher stuff. So if you're with the lieutenant or whatever, you can hear what's going on with the yep. guys way up ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> so they're fighting like hell and um, it goes on for like an hour until you every once in a while you just hear pop. Pops like popcorn, <laughs> you know, it pops intensely for a long time and then at the end right there and then it stopped. And then, then we heard the radio, bring engineers ahead. We got a bunch of stuff that needs to be destroyed and all this. And we haven't done nothing at this point. Nothing except ride and ride. What and kind ride. of vehicles were you in? We were in armored personnel carriers called M113s. They'd been in use since World War II. Just a small metal box with two tank two treads, treads and yeah. 50 caliber machine gun on top. A couple hatches up top. Mm -hmm. yeah. Troop hatch, door lowers in the back. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, that's what we were in, a little tin box. So yeah. they called us engineers ahead to go destroy all the ordinances that was left over from the fight. And mm -hmm. you know, so we started going ahead. It, the area was cleared in this one area where they sent our platoon. Yeah, first platoon. Mm -hmm. It was about 30 of us. And uh, now where were you in the rank structure of the platoon? Were you a platoon sergeant at that point? No, no, I was uh, private, E2. Oh, okay. I, was a, I was a ground guy. I was a Okay. I carried an M16. I was, I was a pretty much a ground pounder. Right. I wasn't a driver. I wasn't a big gunner. I was pretty much just there to carry the explosives, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, we get out, and it's war torn. Something like you see on TV: fired, shit blown up. Excuse my language. Up. That's all right. Dead animals because it's this is like farmland out there. You know, there's lots of cows and lots of sheep wow. and yeah. stuff like that. Dead animals, dead donkeys, dead horses. Just got caught up in all of the melee and dead bodies of fighters and stuff like that some wearing uniform some not wearing uniform because at that point some of them start changing their uniforms and running mm -hmm. away but yeah so anyhow up ahead was a trench a t-shaped trench that the iraqi army had dug on the side of the road for ambushing and for fallback positions or whatever and that's where the infantry guys up ahead of us ran into the most resistance and they said there's a lot of mortar rounds a lot of, of tubes mortar tubes Lots of caches of bullets, all kinds of stuff they come across in those near those trenches. So that's where we were told to go get all the stuff. So once we got up there, we're looking for these trenches. You can't see them because they're in the ground. Yeah. And this 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 vegetation was like tall grass. We're close to there's a river close to there, so it was kind of vegetated. It's not like a desert yeah. at all. Okay. There were palm trees and grass and bushes and it was quite jungle like if you ask mm -hmm. me. We're all walking, all of a sudden we hear gunfire, machine gun fired, and you hear it buzzing going over, ding, 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 Get ding, your ding. attention. Yeah, and everybody hits the ground, and we don't know who's shooting, what's going on, and you hear more and more gun, and it starts cooking up louder and louder and louder. You're heavier, I heard all kinds of stuff going on, and it just, it hell broke loose. And uh, my platoon sergeant was about uh, 20 meters to my left, and he's hollering for me, and the, my other buddy of mine is mm -hmm. to all come down there and consolidate with him, crawl to him. Now we're behind dirt piles. There's dirt piles everywhere from them digging the trenches out. Mm -hmm. 
and we're taking cover behind these dirt piles that we're made, digging bunkers and fighting positions that the Iraqis had dug. So, uh, and you can obviously tell the gunfire's coming from in front of us at the direction we were walking. So we knew we were safe behind the, somewhat sure. safe behind the piles. Yeah. And their bullets popping those piles and dirt flying up, yeah. and we're like, "Yeah, they're shooting at us. Yeah, it's not, it's not our guys. This, this is definitely." Yeah. So you, uh, you hear those rounds cracking over your head. We crawl over to the platoon sergeant and my buddy Paco. We called him. Mm -hmm. I think his last name was really Hernandez. He came, he was the two forty gunner, machine gunner, belt fed machine, heavy machine, not heavy machine gun, but mm -hmm. large machine gun, squad machine gun. And uh, platoon sergeant wants to set him up facing that way and get ready for whatever while he figures out his next move. Mm -hmm. He tells Paco to set up and get his gun loaded up, his weapon loaded up. Paco's like, I didn't bring the bullets. And I remember I was laying there right beside him and platoon sergeant's literally like getting onto him in the middle of all this fight and for not getting, he's like, what are we here for? <laughs> you get out of the vehicle and come over here with, and he got his big heavy machine gun, you know, weighs 50 pounds and you, sure. got, you didn't even bring the bullets. You know? <laughs> And platoon sergeant's losing his mind, you know. And he's, so he's like, follow me. And he goes over and finds some of the other guys. And, and, and by then you start hearing explosions. I'm hearing explosions now, which obviously are hand grenades or grenades mm -hmm. of some type. About that time, the platoon sergeant gets me up with my squad leader, Sergeant Galoxner, and we all get together and consolidate. And they enter the, the some of the other guys ahead of us enter the, Trench. trench that which we finally found which is where all the fighting was going on and they went in and shot them up and, and, and everything and uh it was a mess but none of our guys got hurt somehow i don't That's, you know out of 30 of us there was about in the trench we don't know how many that we killed because there were probably already some that were dead but i know that we probably killed about five or six of them there was about three that were wounded and, and two maybe gave up without being shot but after we figured it all out what it was is they were left over after the firefight hiding and then we were getting closer as we were doing our search and they started getting scared so they just started randomly shooting out of that trench like sporadic spray, fire. Spray and pray kind of thing. Yeah and of course we moved in on them and luckily killed them and isolated, mm -hmm. you know, neutralized them and we didn't get hurt somehow and like I said it was it was a big lesson from then on because after we all got back and the platoon sergeant grabbed Paco and said, this idiot, guess what he did, you know, explain it. So never again, you know, did we uh, jump out of the vehicle with our bullets. And also, it was like we were separated on when we got out. All the sergeants were hanging out with them, smoking and joking, all the privates. We were, we wasn't within our unit, you know, our fighting mm -hmm. units. And we learned quick yes. and we were lucky that day, you know. And, uh, sure. But honestly, that was it. That was all my combat experience in my first deployment. After that was got, enough, though. I mean, you know. <laughs> after we got back, I mean, once we got back to our main element, we, you know, because just our platoon left with some of the tankers and engineers, I mean, tankers and infantry, our mother company, you know, the mm -hmm. other two platoons, they were listening to it all on the radio, you know, all the crap going down, and they just can't believe it because this is the first taste of combat anybody's seen. We've even got first sergeants that have done 20 years, and they ain't seen no sure. combat. Yeah. <laughs> sure. You yeah. know, and... Uh, and they're just, and we came back, we were like rock stars, you know? They were like, wow, tell us all about it. You know, mm -hmm. and it was, it was pretty neat, you know? But once, it, it, when you finally go lay down and everything's quiet and you think about the day that just occurred and how close you really came to dying and, and that you're really in this big, happen tomorrow and, this yeah. big operation that's just mm -hmm. really got nothing to do with you. <laughs> it all really came to me at night, at night. I really started thinking about it. And I was thinking about the whole day, trying to replay it in my head. and wondering what we could have done different or anything, you know, and I'm sure everybody else was too, but. And so then we went to, uh, made it to Baghdad eventually. Now we had a couple other little things pop up here and there. Uh, our main job once we got to Baghdad was securing a bridge that went over the Euphrates mm -hmm. in the green, which is now the green, or then known as the green zone after where all the palaces are at, mm -hmm. Saddam's government, you know, area. Uh, our job then was to secure this bridge that separated pretty much north section of Baghdad from the south section of Baghdad and to secure it. Marines were on the other side mm -hmm. and because uh, they came from the north and we came from the south, pretty much met right there. 
we ran into a small couple small pockets of resistance and they just you know i don't even know why they fought they i guess they were scared they told been told lies of course like sure. throughout history that americans are going to slaughter you if you better fight to the death kind of yeah. thing yeah. you know i know uh, but anyhow we eventually took over that uh, palace which was just down the road from that bridge uh, our job was to go there and sit on it and wait for special forces and cia and all them spooks to get there because there was a bunker under it an underground large underground bunker under and underneath the president the, the olympic palace. palace okay so we went and sat on it and waited for all them guys to get there and then once they got there and started doing their inspections and searching them bunkers and things that's when we started switching to patrols presence patrols and receiving all the ordinances coming in in the garage that we kept so it was between guarding the ordinances every day and bringing that in and cataloging it and doing patrols out just out and about in baghdad just to let them all know that hey the u.s army's still here don't did you uh did you get pretty good training on how to handle that ordinance yeah uh, yes 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 uh you know not blow yourself up. oh yeah we had some accidents one guy got his hand pretty severely wounded he picked up a, a grenade that seemed fine everything seemed fine it started hissing and he went to throw it because he heard it hissing and as soon as he threw it it blew up but it wasn't luckily it was not the grenade did not have its explosive compound in it it just had the fuse okay it was hollowed out like if you've seen training grenades mm -hmm. where you just put the fuse in mm -hmm. and they pop and they explode and they make a noise for training purposes but they don't blow uh, up and throw yeah, no yeah so them. it did yeah luckily it didn't have its explosive compound in it but the blasting cap you know is metal inside it slung metal and it sliced him all up and it messed his hand up so there was a big all right we got to slow down this just picking up anything that we see kind of thing you mm -hmm. know but yeah we uh unbelievable amounts of ordnance unbelievable amounts of guns weapons that saddam had stored that olympic palace itself had thousands and thousands of handguns still in the boxes smith and wesson berettas big dirty hairy ones all the way down the little james bond yeah. just every kind of imaginable gun and pistol you can think of this guy had what happened to all of them we put them in that that big old shit <laughs> and then what and then like i Still said there, the right? next unit came along and we're like here here's the yeah. inventory of 116,000 pistols and you know and then Same they, here and they held on to it till like i said until they set up the army the iraq army i mean the new government and i guess they tried to use those weapons and who knows what happened to it there was even uh the, we found a lot uh, our unit was involved in um finding a large cache of money millions millions of uh, american dollars in pallets and uh our our uh, supply sergeant and his helper got caught up in it and actually got in trouble because they were trying to sneak some of that stuff back he actually did a interview in fhm magazine i believe Sergeant Novax, yeah, he yeah he did a full on interview explaining his side of the story because he was mad because he pretty much took the fall when he said there was all these colonels and generals taking money to you and of course they did <laughs> the lowly supply sergeant yeah. was the one's head who rolled for the whole thing. Duty rolls down, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But there was that, and yeah, that was that was kind of weird because it was it was it was ugly. It was ugly because you know here we are, American forces you know, over there and here trying to steal money and all this stuff, and the mm -hmm. media found out about it. But I never saw it. But yeah, it, when they did find Novak's sergeant, Novak's and his uh, helper, they found out about it. Uh, they went back and searched their sleeping quarters and all that, and they found all kinds of stuff these guys had hoarded. They had had sacks fulls of uh, like gold fittings from the plumbing and the in the oh, i mean yeah. it, they were like pirates they had loot and booty and everything <laughs> guns weapons stored in their connexes they were going to ship back home and all this stuff but it was something it was never a dull moment <laughs> when did you when did you leave over there then on that deployment that deployment as i said uh I had that cyst in my upper buttock it was driving me insane okay that was the one that yeah okay. and we were just told uh we sat there at that palace for months and months and it got hotter and hotter the summer come on we started experiencing our first baghdad summer and, it, and then all of a sudden they, that's when uh things started changing in the war uh that's when the insurgency started coming in and you know fighting us on you know from iran and other al-qaeda mm -hmm. and terrorist groups were starting to come in and uh, 
there started to be sporadic attacks started ramping up and they were said we we're gonna go to Fallujah because Fallujah was going out of control if you recall that's where the Marines fought for so long for, yeah I had a it, good friend of mine son this is right when Fallujah started there. really yeah. getting out of control and I guess that's where it all started so they were gonna send our unit from our cozy little uh, palace, palace we've been living in then now we were going to go and live out of our vehicles in Fallujah for God knows how long and possibly start combat operations mm -hmm. again. And I was like, I can't do this with this in my, because it was already killing me. Every time I sit back, my gear, I put my gear on, my vest would push right on it. Yeah. You know, it's just, so I told my, my squad leader, I need to get something done about this before we do all this because, mm -hmm. so I went to sick call and they went to sick hall they sent me to the doctor and the doctor and then, like i said they got in there and it was infected and they sent me home because mm -hmm. i couldn't have an open wound because if an infected wound you got to pack it and daily yeah. and couldn't be doing that out there yeah you got medics got enough to do with yeah that. and just possible mm -hmm. even worse infection and mm -hmm. so yeah they sent me home early so i got home about three four months before my Re unit what well, did so they eventually went to fallujah and they sat out there when they got back, they told me they were guarding a pretty much a landfill. You joined up with that unit when they got back. Yeah, they came back home. Was that, in, I, was that, in, uh, that was in Georgia. Fort Stewart? Yeah, yeah. Stu in, in Stewart. And they came back, and that's when I was re-enlisting, getting ready to go. To, okay, gotcha. Yep. I'd done, gotten ready, had my sights set on that, re-enlisting, figured out I'm going to be stop-lost. Yeah. That's when I re-enlisted and uh, went to Carson. Sat around, for, got to stay home for about a year or more. Okay. and getting used to Carson and then they're they're good guys and then we deployed with them I deployed with them same kind of unit though or yeah it changed some now the army started changing because <clears throat> now that it started realizing it needed smaller units rather than these large you know battalions of engineers mm -hmm. and battalions of tankers they wanted company level fighting units they wanted within a company of 100 men they wanted tankers infantry and engineers so okay. now yeah so when uh, we when we deployed the second time i'm with my guys we train 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 all year long mm -hmm. felt good about it as soon as we get into kuwait and as we're deploying in because that's where you go first is kuwait mm -hmm. you sit in kuwait for probably a month before you finally go to iraq and, you know but while we're in kuwait they got orders of how we're going to switch up all these fighting co companies and they come to me new sergeant maury e5 with mm -hmm. my two guys under me said hey, sergeant Maury, you and your guys are going to go to delta company tankers i'm so like there's three of you yeah just three of us and i said what for i thought for like a detail like go help them move some mm -hmm. stuff i'm like what are we helping them do something they're like no you're gonna be attached to them for the deployment i'm like the whole deployment and they're like yeah it, it's a new thing we're, we're breaking it down mm -hmm. to smaller fighting groups and i'm like i didn't like it at all you know because well, I you, didn't know Delta Company. <laughs> yeah, and you trained with all these other yeah. guys. Sure. And they're yeah. tankers, you know, they don't even get out they don't get out of their tanks. <laughs> yeah, you know. But uh so I went to Delta Company, met up with their first sergeant commander, the best first sergeant commander I ever had. First sergeant uh, West, uh first sergeant Hunt and Captain West. The best, two best I, I they're tankers, I don't care we, <laughs> they were they were the best <laughs> leaders I've ever Good. had the honor of serving with I, I, I want to say that I hope they can hear me one day say that but yeah uh, it was it was a good a unit that we went to and uh it turned into now at this point that the war had shifted dramatically and the insurgency was full bore we were losing sometimes like 10 guys a week you know not our unit but the, the overall mm -hmm. war effort sure. you know yeah. on the news 10, 10 soldiers were killed today you know mm -hmm. You know, so we're in between five and ten guys were dying a day, and it was really getting rough. You know, and it was all IED attacks, really. That was the new thing, think, the yeah. improvised yeah. explosive, explosive device, yeah. and that was the new thing. And the engineers were the ones looked at, tasked at, to dealing with it because we're the ordnance guys, right? So now here we are, learning on the ground how to deal with this new thing, which really, in historic, historically, in warfare, IED is not new. But as I said, you think the army would understand this? But it was like we were learning all over again how to deal with this thing and so the tanker unit i was attached to we did they didn't they had their tanks parked in the motor pool but they had humvees that's that's all we did is patrols with humvees you know the tankers was this before they got up armored no they were up armored these were these were the, okay. these were really up armored you know with the mm -hmm. thick windows yeah these were some hum dingers here yeah. and uh 
But uh, as I said, you know, I was expecting, oh, I'm going to be with these tankers. But no, these tankers, everybody was doing this police type action job. Whether you were infantry, engineer, Didn't artillery, matter. you were attached to somebody and you went on patrols, driving around, showing presence, captain meeting with the village leaders, talking about building water pipelines and things, fixing, you know, yeah. winning the hearts and minds while at the same time clearing, fighting a war. Clearing the road, yeah. And, and we would get hit every now and again. I, I've been involved in about five IED attacks. One directly on my vehicle on my side. I was driving the first sergeant. Uh, our gunner got hit in the leg with a piece of shrapnel on that one. The shrapnel went right past the first sergeant's head, came through the window. Like, if you looked at him, because the gunner sits in between us, mm -hmm. and his legs are right here. He's on a sling, and his legs are here. And if you did the, the bee line from where that shrapnel would come in in the window and inner thigh of the gunner, I mean, it just went wink in front of the first sergeant's and went right past that dude, hit him in his inner thigh. I'm on his other side of his inner thigh, so luckily his thigh caught it. Yeah. Not me, so. But he was all right. He just bled a lot and hollered, but he was a tough guy. And, but but you, uh, you hit that femoral artery. I mean, yeah, yeah, we were worried can, to death you, about it. And you can you can die in a matter of minutes. We literally. were worried to death about that, but he was all right. And he, he went home for a couple of weeks. He came back. Did he really? Couldn't wait to go back out. He was infantry. Sergeant Brown Lee, he was an infantryman. Uh-huh. He was crazy like that, yeah, like they yeah, all are. Yeah. <laughs> Understand. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that, it's just that, that second deployment, it, it, whew, it, it started getting hairy. It was real. It, it was a lot going on outside the wire. What what time frame year-wise was this? This second? is now uh, about 2005 to 2006 in Iraq. Iraq, I'm sorry. In Baghdad, Iraq. around Baghdad. Mm -hmm. So this is 2005, 2006. Close to 2007. Kind of the height of the war. Yeah, the height. To put it on a graph. Yeah. It started getting real bad right then. When we left, it was getting worse. Mm. And um, that was that deployment. It was just all combat patrols all the time, just going out two and three times a day, just just showing our presence. Just I hated it because we literally were riding around just waiting to get blown up. And that's the way I saw it because that's the way the enemy did. And I understand it. I get it. I mean, when you're fighting war, you're, you got to do what you can to beat the enemy, you know, and sure. if it means surprising them and sneaking up on them, then you do it. But that's the way we fought. We waited till we got hit. Then we try to find them mm -hmm. and do an investigation. Did they stress uh, uh, rules of engagement much? Yes. Too? Yes. Yes, they did. What were they about this time? On this about this point? time, I mean, they were the typical. I know they changed from time to time. Yeah, I mean, immediate threat, uh, holding weapons, things like that obviously holding weapon you only shot to kill you never shot to wound right because a lot of people thought well high value targets because there were high value targets that we would look at before we go on missions to try to identify right. if we saw these people we're like well with this high value target and you know we want him alive for information he's running we shoot him in the ass and let's save him for later and they're yeah. like no if you're going to shoot you're going to kill, kill him. him and that's it and I'm like, yeah that's Probably and you're not going to shoot him in the back. And that was the thing. If he's running and he ain't got a weapon, but you know it's him. That's what I'm saying. That's what killed us. Because if we know it, then we got to pursue on foot or run or and put ourselves in further danger mm -hmm. trying to play football with this guy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was kind of, yeah, your hands are tied sometimes. And it is aggravating because you're, you're fighting an enemy whose hands aren't tied. And he doesn't care. And he, mm -hmm. You know, you wish you could play by the same rules, but that mm -hmm. separates us from the barbarians, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, the rules of engagement at that time, I mean, they were, they were, I wouldn't say they were lax. It wasn't like all out war, but there was a lot to think about every time something went down, you know, yeah. because there was a lot of uh, after action inter interviews and after action reviews. Who and would interview you on those? Would it be well, first it would be the, or? our commander, the commander, mm -hmm. well, the lieutenant, the officer in charge of the, the, the patrol. Mm -hmm. He would, of course, do after action. Mm -hmm. And then if there was actual combat and stuff like that, uh, and then the com commander, it was uh, he had to do an after action review. Then I guess he'd send it to battalion. If they felt the need, they would come down and do theirs just to cover their butt if it seemed like they needed to, you know. Because mm -hmm. sometimes there could be wounded civilians involved and things like that that had to be addressed. And you know, we got some lieutenant colonel that don't want to lose his job over some dead. Or yeah, that he can't yeah. answer why they're dead. You right. know? 
so yeah there's a lot to it you know it's like really bureaucratic process you know in this chaotic war do you but, find that you and your buddies find that kind of frustrating oh yeah definitely you know, uh, yeah. definitely because there was so much sop involved in it there was so much you know it's, it's almost like you know you've heard you know cliche of like a cop like i don't i don't want to deal with paperwork you know it's like you let things go because you know it's going to end in a lot of paperwork you know you, you're, your your decision making is mm -hmm. affected by the tedious bureaucratic process that you're going to have to deal with like like i need to sleep i need to go i need to get <laughs> sleep i don't need yeah. to be up doing paperwork for three hours you know mm -hmm. doing interviews with each soldier about what they saw and and then where were they at on the battlefield and you know just wow I mean, it's just it was ridiculous it's like when do we sleep because we already were only getting like maybe five hours of sleep if you're lucky you know yeah. and you, you, and at the end of a 12-hour shift or whatever you can't be very sharp if you've only had yeah it was ridiculous it was getting ridiculous yeah of course the third deployment uh was also with fort that carson was out of fort, yeah fort it was carson. also with fort carson and uh now the ieds have changed a bit the, the IEDs previously were always mortar rounds, like 155 millimeter artillery rounds, large mm -hmm. artillery rounds about that big were the biggest ones. They would rig those to explode in some kind of way, whether it be triggered by pressure plate or triggered by the infrared, like a shopping door entrance, mm -hmm. infrared triggering system or manual trigger system. Like well, a that's sophisticated though, huh? Yeah, yeah. yes. We really? investigate all that. And that's what I'm saying. You get hit with an IED, that's when the engineers yeah, some of them they could do on a cell phone couldn't they? well the, our job even if it was like the idea say we're on patrol the first vehicle got hit and they're all right they got some flat tires or whatever because mm -hmm. the 155 round wasn't that bad unless it blew up directly under the vehicle they would put them on the side of the road they'd explode our armor would absorb it and take it mm -hmm. and deflect it and hopefully you know the gunner up top didn't went too far up and didn't catch anything and uh it was just more or less it was blowing our eardrums and scaring the hell out of us and uh hitting us every now and again but uh every now and again they would get one under the road somewhere in some terrible area like whether it be a culvert or or, or pipe underground or something they could stick one under there and that's when things can get nasty a vehicle can flip catch on fire sure. and uh so the third deployment the ieds had changed they, they now had the efp which was the explosion uh, explosively formed munition munition which means they basically make an explosive tube of some sort that would tr project the explosion outward and they put about a two to three inch thick copper plate on top of that explosion so when in the initial explosion the superheated velocity mm -hmm. of that forms that munition into a pretty much a spear a flying metal that it'll it'll go through kind of like a shape charge kind it'll of thing. go through eight nine inches of anything you put in front of it you know mm -hmm. it'll make a little bitty hole but it'll go in there and just destroy everything mm -hmm. so the efp was terrible you know you couldn't really where do were they where were they coming from I mean, iran they were, they were, iran's was backing back in the, the whole, demise of the it you know thing. just as much as we would back the guerrilla warfare of any enemy of ours fighting mm -hmm. you know they were they were there to cause problems and they had their uh special forces units coming in and training the the terrorists on the ground in iraq how to make these certain and of course supplying them with the proper Explosive, materials yeah. to make them mm. teach them how to make them while well, we come across many ied making facilities where they would be mm. having literally where you could see where they had sh teaching classes and showing people how to do it how to aim them all kinds of things how to detonate them all the different you know and uh it's just aggravating it was real aggravating because now here we are now that it's changed the engineer's job now we're uh using large vehicles the buffalo that has the large yeah. arm and camera and all this technology which we never dealt with as i said earlier on it was like we were adapting constantly every deployment was different and now here we are on a third deployment using this equipment that we're just now learning we just got it the the, the, the large vehicles that have the the uh, which i can't i didn't even ride in one i rode in the buffalo more than anything but uh, mm -hmm. then we had these little robots that you unleash from the buffalo that would go out there you know and, and manipulate the the ied yeah. but now 
we didn't haul butt. Before, we used to haul butt. That was the thing. Go as fast as you can. When you're outside the wire and you're on patrol, don't go slow. Go fast. It's, it's harder to hit you, you know? Yeah. That was always the thing. Everywhere we went, we were like just kn white knuckle driving, you know? But now it's like, no, you go real slow and you look. So now you go like three miles an hour and you look and you got all these spotlights outside the vehicle and you got your own little spotlight you can control and you try to identify them. So that was the new mission, was mm -hmm. route clearance involving the Buffaloes and uh, this other vehicle. It looks like a, a, gro a road grader, you know, it grades roads, mm -hmm. but it's not. It, it looks like that because it's made to design, only be operated by one guy, and it's got a, a mine detector underneath it that looks like the grader, but it's mm -hmm. not. It's a mine detector or metal detector. And it's got a long nose with two wheels, and it's designed that way so if that front end runs over something or detonates the front end will get explosions up, up there yeah, yeah not where the driver is yeah. in this little cupola that he sits in yeah and he's in front of the route clearance and then you've got the MRAPs which got the ground guys in them which are just the big tall trucks and then somewhere along the way you'd have the buffalo in the back waiting if the if the mine detector guy found something or saw something the buffalo would go up ahead with his arm, reach out, mess with it, touch yeah, it, it, poke it, and <laughs> figure out what it is. Yeah. So that was the new game. And we had a lot of explosions that detonate on us from that. And that was your third deployment. And what, what time frame are we talking now about? Now this is like a, it's like 2007 to 8, somewhere, okay. or, or 8, close to 9. And that's when I finally, I think everything started catching up with me. You know, the, the deployments, the, the combat, my home life being away from home so much yeah which ended, ended in divorce at the end of the arm, my army's tour of, i mean my whole stint in the army i mean it's pretty much got divorced when i was leaving too and everything was just stressful and that's when i started having symptoms while in iraq i would experience panic attacks triggered by whatever i mean it could be the combat situations that would occur or it could just be one day i get so stressed out that mm -hmm. you know and uh it happened a couple times while I was outside the wire, and that's when I finally I told him I was like, "Look, I'm I'm having panic attacks or heart attacks. I was having heart attacks at first. <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's what it feels like. It's, it's just, just yeah. yeah. And uh, I told him about it, and I started talking to the the shrinks over there in Iraq and stuff. You know, but still conducting combat operations with my unit. But it kept happening, and it got worse and worse until the point the doctor finally said, "All right, that's enough." You, mm -hmm. you're going to hurt yourself or hurt right, someone yeah. else out sure. there you know and then i sat around for about three months uh, at uh camp taji in country then yeah. in iraq mm -hmm. talking to the uh, the doctors mm -hmm. on my own my unit was out you know i wasn't even with my unit i was all by myself living in my own little okay. domicile did, and did you have a certain end of tour date when you knew you were going to leave country no no at that point we did our whole unit yeah, mm -hmm. we'd only been there. We'd only been there probably for about four months. Okay. We had we were on an eighteen month deployment. It wasn't going to be a year. It was going to be eighteen months. Wow, I didn't realize they had them that oh, long. Oh yeah, yeah. My second deployment turned into eighteen months. It was supposed to be a year, but about a year into it, they're like, it's going to be eighteen yeah. months, which mm -hmm. was a real kick in the you know what. Oh yeah. When you thought because you, it was you over. get yourself psyched up, you know. The, when you thought it was that, over. That goal, yeah. So yeah, and then. Uh, it got, I went home and I sent, they sent me home and then I just kept on uh, dealing with the doctors at home and d decided, yeah, I just want to get out. If I can get out, I want to get out on a medical, you know, because they're like, we can work through this and send you to doctors and maybe you can continue your career in the army and all that. And I just got, I was, I was like, nah, I've had enough. I really had at that moment in time. I did. How much time did you have altogether active duty? Active yeah. duty? Uh, it was what 2002 to 11 like i said i sat at home for a year so i mean it was eight years two three four five six seven eight yeah, yeah eight nine years and then from what you said then it was about three to four years of actual combat during that yes so about half your time yeah that's a lot yeah that's a lot it, you know and it's it was a it was breakneck pace sure it was it was an unbelievable pace that uh we were moving in and the and uh, the army rolls on; it doesn't it's, stop. It's it just, amazing that you, that they, as many guys came through it like you. That well, it's, it's lots of us are like in my exact same shoes. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. it depends on who you are as an individual, I guess, of how much of that you can take, or you know, until you break. 
or you know some people can just go and go and go and go and, you know, psychopaths that don't have no emotion or you know, yeah. sure or no apathy or whatever is mm -hmm. good good for you perfect job for you but I guess for a, a normal person yeah yeah you, know, you got a breaking point somewhere and sure and uh, I found mine yeah. you know it's so like, you got discharged where from Fort Carson yeah you discharged out of Fort Carson mm -hmm. and came back here because it's home this area home and well this time as I said uh, it, that, that whole year it took a whole year to get out of the army basically mm -hmm. from the time I started experiencing the symptoms in Iraq from the time I left Carson it was a good year of time and within that whole year as I said my marriage deteriorated and did we, you get divorced then well we wasn't officially divorced but we were done she mm -hmm. was with other person other people mm -hmm. I've seen other people and that's when I started to talk to my hometown sweetheart from long ago we rekindled our relationship I came home on leave went back mm -hmm. found out she was pregnant and I was like wow so I still had like you know about about nine months to go till I got out of the army it, through medical discharge mm -hmm. you know so pretty much she was pregnant the whole time I was getting out of the army and, and literally she had the baby about a week before I got home before I was able to leave Carson mm -hmm. so she had the baby and the baby was about a week old and then I came home and as I said assumed daddy daycare you know and been doing okay. it ever since yeah but uh, how, how old is it? is it a boy it was good this was the girl. girl she's she's going to be in middle school this upcoming year so okay. she, she'll be 13 it's yeah. 13 years ago God bless you <laughs> <laughs> well I guess that, those girls yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah. I mean, with my problem, my stress, anxiety, and panic attacks, and uh, PTSD type uh, symptoms, uh, I honestly, I think it was the, it, it just happened to work out, but it was the best medicine, just leaving the army and just putting it behind me for a moment, leaving my ex-wife, which we mm -hmm. hated each other's guts, so I, mm -hmm. you know, I was good to get away from her, but, and just coming home and, and literally raising little babies, and it was, it was therapeutic, it was, sure. it was very... It was nice. I didn't have nothing to do except get up and deal with little babies all day, which I don't care what anybody says, man. It's kind of neat. I've been dealing with these kids all day. It ain't like that. It's a pleasure cruise if you do it right. Sure. You know, keep them on schedule on a pattern. Don't yep. let them lead you. But yeah, it was it was a great. Well, you got to set limits, and then it was a great experience. It was wonderful. It couldn't have worked out better. Is to experience that fatherhood like that and raising them, and you know, from chicks to young women that they are now yeah yeah so. had you ever thought about staying in the reserves to get mm. your 20. no no never considered that i mean with my stress anxiety and everything i think i'm pretty much there Don't over me now by now anyhow i just be yeah. a liability uh-huh but uh yeah so yeah it was action-packed it was always action-packed i mean I, I, there's a million things i could tell you about each deployment but Mm -hmm. I mean the, the carnage there's lots of carnage there's lots of stuff that like the youth that we had to fight there was a lot of youth a lot of that bothered me you know like the idea that they would train these basically 12 13 year old kids had to detonate these IEDs and they would give them money or whoever mm -hmm. this way that the, the Taliban fighters or the Al-Qaeda or whoever terrorist group it was we were dealing with didn't have to put themselves out there to be captured and, or killed so they would hire sure. a naive 12, 13 year old Iraqi kid that ain't got nothing and, or threatening, you know, whatever their means. But that's mm -hmm. how we found ourselves in a lot. We were fighting kids that didn't even know what the reason was for fighting or, yeah. or maybe they did. Maybe they had vengeance on their mind because we killed their uncle during the invasion. I don't know, but, uh, but that's what we yeah. saw a lot and that sucked. That, you know? I was gonna say that would get it's to just you. like, like a on one patrol ied exploded we were on we had four vehicles in the convoy the ied exploded like on the second vehicle i was like in the last vehicle and uh there was a operating procedure when id would explode like that depending upon which vehicle got hit or which vehicles disabled is how you deal pro, with the situation yeah so the first vehicles hit next vehicle runs up in front of it pulls security there the other two vehicles come to its side the rear vehicle turns its gun around you have 360 there's a protocol to it so we trained a lot and we were pretty good at it so whichever vehicle was hit even if it was the last vehicle we knew how to turn around and get in position 
and then figure out what we're going to do next. Yeah, which we do it get, without thinking. Almost. Go in there. We got to get wounded out. What do we got to do? Are they shooting at us? And already, you know. But anyhow, first vehicle got hit, and uh, we started running into our positions. The first vehicle it didn't even get disabled. I don't believe. I think it just maybe blew out a tire, like they always did. But two individuals were hauling across this field to the left, running. And one of the vehicles started opening up with the machine gun, bow, 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 and gunned them down. You saw them go down and all that. So we ran out there with a couple Humvees and left the other two back at the site to go check on what they just shot up. Mm -hmm. And one's dead, the other one's alive, and he's probably about a 13-year-old kid. And he's messed up. He's, his, his lower half is pretty messed up, and mm -hmm. just, he's not going to make it. Yeah. And, uh, he was saying something, and we had an interpreter with us. The, the platoon leader had an interpreter. And we got our medic. Medic was trying to help the kid, and the kid kept pushing the medic away and pushing the medic away and blah, 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 talking in Iraqi. And the platoon, platoon leader asked the interpreter, what is he saying? What's he, why won't he let him? He's like, and the interpreter is like, he's saying, fuck you, Americans. Fuck you. Leave me yeah. alone. Fuck you. Yeah. And you know, There's a lot of hatred there. Though. Yeah, and he, here he is. We're going to try to help him. He's bleeding to death, and you know. Yeah. But just to see that kind of hate out of some a young kid, you know, it's like they had to start real young. Yeah. The reason I think keeps most soldiers going during combat, during any war, even the Great War, when there was more patriotism than there could ever be for our country. Mm -hmm you're fighting for each other you're there in this situation you're it's not about the flag anymore it's not about you know saving america and you no know, it's about let's get the hell out of here alive all yeah. of us you know and it's yeah and it becomes that and i mean i guess that makes you fight you know well, you're still fighting that, that loyalty <laughs> that camaraderie yeah you at least you're there you, you got a reason to fight and live so sure yeah but yeah that's the way it always was with me you know and I look at this war, and I, at the time, and hearing about it from you know media and things like that, and how ridiculous the war was, and was becoming even the reason for going to war to begin with. You know, we still don't really know what, why, mm -hmm. you know, how could such a thing happen? Why would it happen? You know, it must be something so far out of our understanding that we might as well just forget it and move on. <laughs> You know, but in retrospect, I'm very proud of my service. I'm proud of what I did. I'm proud of all my, my buddies and yeah, all this. You should be. Should. And the, the experience was grand in a sense that I experienced something that not everybody gets to experience. And right. Even though it's, at times it was, it was a, it could be carnage or it could be awful. But at times it's also enlightening and you get to see a different. Find out who you really are. Yeah. What you're really see what you're of. capable of. Sure. And, uh, so that's it. I don't have any regrets with it. I don't have I don't have nightmares and things like that. If I have nightmares, when I do have nightmares about the army, it's about yeah, I'm always in the army, but I'm not in, I'm out. But they think I'm still in. They're always like, yeah, we got to pack our bags and we got to go here and do this. And I'm always like, whoa, 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 I'm out, man. I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, uh. And they're like, no, 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 no. And it's always some. And it's like that feeling of dread that like y'all are wrong, man. I'm not going with y'all again. It's, it's never like you know fighting and shooting and explosions and no it's always like they're trying to drag me back in and that's like my hell <laughs> that's, no, that's my hellish nightmare with the yeah. army is that they're going to bring me back into it you know and like no 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 i've had my fun you go and have your words <laughs> yeah, right. so yeah it's like i don't you know i don't i don't freak out when the fireworks blow up or anything like that i mean no more than anybody else that's would it. yeah i've often I mean, it, it is, it's my own life, looking mm -hmm. through my eyes and my experiences with the military and America, the United States. What baffles me the most is that I do live my life and I live it through, God gave me the soul of an American. That is what is the most unbelievable thing to me. Because like I said, when it come down to my service, it wasn't so much, I was a patriot, like I, I gotta go do my duty because mm -hmm. these, these assholes blew up our, our building you know, and killed all these people. And, it wasn't that, you know, yes, I was mad, yeah, of course, but that wasn't what drove me. Mm -hmm. As I said, it was financial reasons, really, what drove me and stability and just needed direction in my life to yeah. do what I had to do. But it, it's just, when it comes down to it, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I've seen, like I said, I've seen how bad the other, the rest of the world can be in Iraq, in third world nations and their, their villages and their people and their, 
the, the regimes that have come and gone and all the oppression and everything that they've dealt with. And I'm like, I could have been born one of them. You know, I could be looking through their eyes. Yeah. Thank and, God I was born in the United States. And that right there is just like, well, okay, God granted me, blessed me being a part of the most powerful, richest, greatest nation on earth. I better be patriotic. Mm -hmm. I can only be patriotic, you know? And you, you, once you go away and you do see the rest of the crappy world that we live in, and you come home, yes, you appreciate it much, much more. At least I did. Yeah. yeah. So I said, I didn't, I didn't think that way before I ever left this country. I didn't ever think, I mean, I was just too I mean, naive to think about it, I guess, or yeah. just too busy to even worry about it or dream about it, how it would really be mm -hmm. to be a, a, an Iraqi on the streets of Baghdad, your government just got overthrown, you got these marauding terrorists running through your streets, yeah. fighting and fighting us on your street, threatening you because you gave us some water or something the day before, you know, yeah. helped or, us, you know, just awful. You know. Or you're the second cousin of a guy that interpreted for the Because we would find that a lot too. We would find a, a, a situations like our interpreters that would help us. They were from all over the place, not just Iraq. They were from Sudan, Libya, other countries because they would have to bring in people from far away they couldn't use locals because they would al-qaeda would find out who they mm -hmm. were track and go and kill their family mm -hmm. leave like at one instance i wasn't there to see it but i heard about it they brought some interpreters kids dead body and left it outside the gate tortured and mangled and all that shit just to send a message these animals you know and it's yeah. that's what i'm saying that's what when I, when I came back home and i realized the great you country we live that. in that's yeah right. I yeah. was proud to be sure. an American. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Keeping our, we're not savages. I mean, I know we are, and we can be as human beings, but not in America as itself. As the, the idea of America, we're we are a good people. <laughs> we're not savages. Good and proud. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, Angus, thank you very much. Okay. Well, All right. It's been fun.